part of this post pandemic employment policies. Um, first thing, uh, I'd really wanted this to be much more interactive with questions and uh, time to stop, but because of so many people had signed up, it's just not going to be possible. So at the end, uh, please write to me at, at shall, S H A L L, griffinhammis.com. You'll have that address at the end at the end of today and please don't hesitate then to write to me for those um uh those questions that you that you might have i can't write a book back to you or anything like that but uh, but again i'm you know i just want you to know that questions you have i'll be saying a lot of things that are designed to cause questions so uh, please uh, just write me on that um the um So what, what this is going to be about is needed changes going forward. Uh, a lot of folks will be wanting, okay, I need something right now. I need something in the next six months. I need something with what's going on. And there's plenty of, of other webinars, certainly through uh, Griffin Hammis and Associates, that you should absolutely uh, either attend in person like you are today or go there and they have been um, taped taped or, or, or um, uh, recorded so for you to look at. I think they're on YouTube. But anyway, you can go to the, the Griffin Hammis website and, and, and find those. Um, here's the deal. Uh, states are going to need to rewrite their Medicaid waivers post pandemic. Um, states waivers are five year products that last and then sometimes they're just um, um, revised slightly in the last year after year. I know of a waiver in one of the states that was written in 1981. And if you look at the waiver that they have today that's serving uh, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, then it's, it is um, uh, for all intents and purposes the exact same waiver with just some of the dollars uh, changed with uh, inflation or, or more allocation from the legislature. So that waiting until it's time to write another waiver is probably not going to be um, uh, sufficient, in my opinion. And 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 so so know that this is about rewriting rewriting eight, uh, home and community based uh, services waivers. It's not what all it's about, but it's it's about that. Um, so everything that I'll be suggesting, so many things that that you may say, I've never heard of that before. All right, I didn't know you could do that, or why didn't somebody say that before? Why don't we do that in our state? All those kind of questions know that everything I'll be suggesting is either happening right now, has happened in states, that is, has been authorized, paid for, uh, services and supports were delivered in, in, in this ma manner uh, to, to facilitate the integrated employment of citizens uh, with intellectual disabilities and mental health needs, or it is happening in other countries. When we get to the late latter slides, you'll see that I'll be saying here, and here is how other nations, primarily the 30 European nations, how they are handling community integrated employment uh, and have been handling it uh, for, for some time. Um, so this is about uh, the next decade, 2021 to 2030, and about uh, people with uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities and folks with mental health needs and primarily through writing something called an I state plan amendment. Almost every word that I say something like that would, would take another you know, hour and a half to explain all the details of what is an I state plan amendment and how is that different than how you might deliver mental health services in other, in other ways. But uh, I would just say that that uh, that 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 I cannot <clears throat> excuse me, uh, certainly get deeply into, but just know that every word that's being said here that might relate to people with intellectual and developmental disabilities absolutely can happen, not maybe can happen or sort of can happen or 95% can happen, but 100% can happen through um, I state plan amendments. Okay. What about VR? Everything that we'll be talking about over this time also applies to vocational rehabilitation. In fact, vocational rehabilitation uh, the Rehab Services Administration is even more flexible in what types of services and supports that might be able to be possible, what may be able to be paid for individual plan. They empower their, uh, by law since 1973, 
They've empowered their vocational rehabilitation counselors to do all kinds of amazing, creative, and um, great things individually, person by person for citizens who uh, are interested in community integrated employment. So uh, when you hear references, don't think, well, he's talking about those people. Just know that I'm always going to be talking about, about uh, folks, including folks um, uh, beyond those folks that are, that are eligible for customized employment. I'll be talking about folks that are beyond what uh, it's just eligible for support employment. I'll be talking about that as you relate to these things, as you, as you, as you listen to some of these things that you may be able to relate to, it includes other folks that have disabilities. And let's just say other folks who are having an extremely challenging time and have had for many years of being able to be a part of a community integrated workforce, basically people that are, that are uh, you know, grossly underemployed and, and, um, and unemployed. On VR, number one issue is rate development. Again, it would take hours. I've spent days uh, consulting with states. Um, well, I spent a week with one state. Uh, every single day, eight hours a day on rate development issues regarding uh, vocational rehabilitation and how that dovetails with Medicaid funding. So just know that that rate development is 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 the uh, mother load of issues regarding vocational rehabilitation. And once that's understood, how you develop effective rates, how it's not about, well, I think we'll try $35 an hour for community integrated employment. Well, maybe maybe 40 will do it. Well, what, well, we can pay, do 46. So you'll, that kind of guessing is, is, is uh, not what this is about. This is about um, something very different. This is about fidelity. So if you know that, um, you know, Griffin Hammes, myself and Beth and others have created the uh, the uh, fidelity scales for um, um, for discovery and for um, customized job development. So certainly it's about fidelity, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so this is about better guidance, uh, about better financing, and how that that would work. Okay, let's get started then. I want to thank the direct support professionals who are there, who are um, not just on this call. I'm thanking those for there. They are our doctors and nurses in our field. They are the people that are there. They are people with absolutely that are risking their lives, to provide supports and services to people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So know that um, um, I hope that from this, that, that we, we will finally learn how very, very important uh, uh, people are who care and, 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 and help people with um, intellectual de development and developmental disabilities and mental health needs every single day and I'm working there directly to them. Uh, and I'll have a lot more maybe in a, a little bit to say about that. Um, this presentation is gonna be about this, is that there are lots of things that need to change in the United States moving forward post pandemic. Some of those are very, very obvious. Others are like, wow, I didn't know that they would have that big of impact. I guess we do need to change that. I guess that would make everybody a lot safer. It would make a, a sounder, a sounder country and nation. I'm not going to discuss any of those things that have to do with the changes that may be necessary in the United States. But what I am going to talk about today is the changes, the parallel changes, the changes that need to happen for um, services and supports for, for people with um, significant disabilities, in particular, of course, about employment. What, how might we go about doing that differently? What other tools, what things might be missing or were seen as optional that you had to be in the right state at the right time to be able to get that opportunity how can we make that so that's uh, nationwide for, for every, every opportunity? Um, this will be about what I think we should do. Uh, uh, I'll be talking about professionalization of the field of HCBS waiver services. And so I just wanna just reemphasize that, that every direct support professional today 
that is working, we're going to need you and, and everyone else. So when you hear me talk, talk about, oh, and here's these other folks that are going to be able to del deliver powerful rehabilitation, habilitation, psychosocial um, interventions using customized employment, then know that, I, that, I, that that doesn't mean, oh, then everybody has to become that. No, not in any means. I'm just saying that we need to be sure that we have a really highly talented and professional work, workforce in addition to the uh, direct support professionals that, that are uh, caring for folks every day. So that says it, you know, need people to care uh, for people and we need people to provide psychosocial habilitation and rehabilitation services. That is what we're getting paid for. That is what that is what the laws say in vocational rehabilitation and in and Medicaid for home and community based services that we what we promised many, many years ago is that we know what we're doing, what we're going to deliver our psychosocial habilitation and rehabilitation services, although we usually don't use those words to describe what we're doing. We talk more about day services or or customized employment, but what they are seen as, or what they are in their essence in the law, are psychosocial habilitation and rehabilitation services. Services that make a difference, services that get something done. So that's what we will be, we'll be talking about. With that said, because what happens is folks wanna be realistic. Let's be realistic. Let's be pragmatic. Let's be <laughs> Let's be step by step. Let's be. Uh, wait a minute. Well, that's nice if uh, you know we got all day to talk about what might be happening in the future. You know, some uh, years from now. But what I believe is going on there is people are evading the responsibility for tomorrow by trying to just focus on, well, let's focus on the reality before us today. And so understand that I am saying you cannot escape that responsibility for what's, what is tomorrow. It didn't just happen, it didn't just happen or come on us and, oh, I didn't know that was going to happen. Oh, I didn't know that. This is about the responsibility that we all have to be prepared and to be ready for tomorrow and to make changes, start begin making changes to be ready for that and not use today's reality as our excuse to, well, I got so much to do now that I just can't, I can't even think about what's going to happen tomorrow, that that will not work in, um, in the future post pandemic for um, citizens with disabilities. So it's about then this, this evading reality is about a fear of the unknown, it's a fear of uncertainty. We oftentimes try to drive towards certainty. This is, a, is, is about that, that fear of that. It's about living in a world of probabilities. Well, that probably won't happen. Well, of course, the pandemic probably won't happen. Uh, probably, that probably won't happen. It didn't happen for 102 years. That means it's probably not going to happen tomorrow. Well, it did. And, 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 that, and that is what that way of thinking takes us down that same road, which we should be, at least at this point, at least aware that that way of thinking may not be serving ourselves or the citizens we, we love and care about so much. So this is about a world of possibilities, not probabilities. So it's about shifting the change that this will probably be the case, given the balance of odds, this is what we should probably be concentrating or thinking about the most. It's about not thinking that way, but instead thinking what might be the possibilities and how can we prepare for possibilities and how can we prepare not for possibilities that may be negative, but possibilities that will be extremely positive and valuable to people. And that's what we're going to talk about. Okay, in 1972, guiding Wolf Wolfensberger, Dr. Wolfensberger, Syracuse University, wrote a book that changed the entire uh, world. I was fortunate enough to live at a time when he actually uh, was still alive and got to go see him. My boss says, Steve, uh, I, I was there, I'd worked at this organization for about six weeks. He said, there's a guy at, uh, uh, named Wolf Wolfensberger that's going to speak uh, at a local university. Uh, go, have you, do you know him? No, I never heard of him before. He said, well, 
uh, go um, check him out. <clears throat> It'll change your life. You'll come back a different person. Really? Yeah, okay. So Connie advised that I did that. <clears throat> Here's what somebody said about in 1972 about him. Today, every single thing we do on behalf of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities is based on this book. Every single thing, every way we think about things unconsciously, how we think about what needs to happen to help citizens would have intellectual and developmental disabilities is based on 19, a book written in 1972. But it was called at the time a radical interpretation of what he, that is Wolfensberg, and what he thinks is possible in services and supports for persons with dis developmental disabilities. As you might guess, that it was not warmly received. It's like, what in the world? Who's he think he is to tell us what we should do when we know for sure that we've built these institutions for these citizens? State institutions have spent billions and billions of dollars making them uh, you know, supposedly safe and great places for people to be. <clears throat> and who is he to say that, that they should be anywhere else? So that's where we were in 1972. Okay, so, um, oh, I want to say something about, uh, just, just for people on, on, you know, on the mental health side. Although Wolfensberger wrote that 50 years ago. Know then that the Wolf Wolfensberger for mental health would be Thomas Saz. And some of you are aware, some of you may be here on here, uh, or may be very well of Thomas Saz's work and, and would, would see that perspective and know that he's guiding um, you know, some some, uh, some great leaders in mental health on that. So, so uh, but going on to where we are, where we are right now. <clears throat> um, so here's fair warning. Uh, with all I'm about to say and uh, and what we're going to talk about today is um, um, know that you're going to have some difficulty with what I have to say if these kind of phrases come out of your mouth regularly. Now, each of us have said any of these things, uh, certainly at different times. But if it's regular that you're saying, um, oh, those ideas are great if we had a perfect world, or, um, uh, this, you know, come, let's be realistic here. You know, uh, well, oh, whoa, whoa, wait, 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 wait let's just don't talk about that or think about that now. Let's cross this bridge when we come to it. So th those kind of things, just know that this this what you're about ready to hear is going to this this kind of thinking is going to is going to cause some difficulty for you, you know. So just know a uh, fair warning on that because this way of thinking about things to, to go along to best be best uh, you know to get along we best go along is not going to be so conducive to uh, to the changes that are going to be needed in the next um, decade. When we hope to we hope for the best and plan for the worst, we get what we planned. Because what's going to happen is you're going to get what you planned and what you didn't plan, as we now know very clearly. So I'm saying plan for the best. Plan for the best. We hope for the best, plan for the worst, we get what planned. Do we plan for the worst? Of course. Of course, yeah, we we yeah, yeah, yeah. We all know about you know, the black swan. We all know that, that there is um, uh, also anomalies that happen. We all we now know clearly that it can happen. Things can happen. Only happen every 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 century. That it can happen to be devastating to to uh, a, a world. But we have the job to <clears throat> plan for the best, and then we'll get what we plan for. There will be plenty of thing, plenty, plenty there. There was one talk you know a long time ago. Uh, there was a person named T. Barry Brazelton. He said, "How do you raise your children?" He was a famous child psychologist, how, how, what's the best way to raise kids? And he said, well, you, you show them you know, how tough life can be and you know, so they take the hard knocks so they'll be prepared for the tough future, or you show them paradise, you know, just show them all one, wonderful things. So it, what's the research show on that? Because different points of view on that. The research says clearly, show your children paradise. Show them, absolutely show them paradise. Because there's gonna be plenty of things in this world that's gonna show them what paradise is not, far from it. Or somebody else is gonna deliver that. But it's be, be important as adults that they have some basis for what what is good and what is not. So just so just know, know that that's what that that lower right hand box is saying. You're going to get what you plan for and you and, and what you didn't. 
So let's plan for the best. Okay, providers. Uh, day centers and workshops, group homes, providers with a side of community integrated employment. That's what's going on. That's what is going on. That's what's going on for 60 years. 98.2% of all dollars spent in home and community-based waiver services is spent for people to be in day centers, workshops, group homes, or some grouping of people together with forays into the community endlessly year after year, decade after decade for the last 60 years. With 1.8% of the resources being spent on community integrated employment. So that's what's going on. That that's when when, when vocational rehabilitation and 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 uh, DD uh, intellectual development disabilities start interacting with each other immediately it, it you know for people in the vocational rehabilitation perspective say wow that is some significant resources that you all are spending to keep people grouped together in facilities, in buildings, you know, sleeping in the, in the same house together. That is some serious uh, uh, resources. What we're about is community integrated employment. So in 1986 was when, uh, it, it, to my recollection, other people will say, no, no, we were doing it, you know, in, in California in this one place and, uh, you know, at this time, or we, no, no, we had this at this time. But for my be best recollection, is that integrated non-facility employment services the first time we had a provider in the united states that was not delivering all this uh, all these other things was only delivering community integrated employment that would be supported employment at that time was um <clears throat> supported employment of virginia and it began in 1986 34 years ago and since then there's been many others so just know that the idea of a provider um, there, there's, there's a lot of ways that people can be, um, you know, uh, providers. Okay. So rapid single decade change, 1905 and before people are in horses, carriages, buggies, that's what transportation looked like. In the decade between 1905 and 1915, the United States switched from carriages to cars. In just 10 years, a system of roads and bridges and new vehicles completely transformed the entire way that human beings traveled in just 10 years. Just before we, I'll talk a little bit more about it in a second, but think about this. In 1880, 90% of all secretaries were women. I'm sorry, were men. Were men. In 1880, 90% of all secretaries were men. In 1890, 90% of all secretaries were women. In just 10 years, an entire profession. One of the most important professions in every single business and encounter in the United States transformed from being men primarily doing the job, overwhelmingly and primarily doing the job, to women primarily doing the job because of a technology, something you may have heard of, called a typewriter. And some notion that folks had that somehow the fingers of women were more dexterous or something, or, you know, that's, that was the thinking. There was a lot of other things that they were certainly thinking also about those duties uh, of that secretary. But um, so know this, in America, we have a deep, deep tradition of, of a tech fix for any problem or any situation we have. And that a technological fix is usually what Americans tend to turn to. And I want you to know that I will not be talking about any technological fixes that are necessary that we've got to have to let some technology or way we go about things fixing the next 10 years. What, what is the case though, is that we need definitely psychosocial rehabilitation fix, fixes. We need, we need to do some things that are gonna, gonna be um, significantly different than we have 
that don't involve technology, but how people interact with each other. Okay, so so this carriage of the cars, just a little bit on that, more on that, is that of course people didn't agree. It didn't like everybody said, oh, well, great. We got cars. Hey, Henry Ford. Oh, wait, hey, thank you for that Model T. That's great. Now we're all going to just be cruising around in it. And, you know, it's, you got, you're only, we're going to have to pay, you know, um, you know, between um, $300 and $800 brand new for uh, a Model T. And so at that time, so it's like, wow, OK, we're all set. No. In fact, the automobile was founded way before then in the middle of the of the 1800s in Britain. They had it, but because of horse breeders, wagon, carriage manufacturers, toll road operators, and ferry operators, they passed the Red Flag Act, which said that a person must walk ahead by 50 feet ahead of any uh, uh, motorized, uh, non-horse driven carriage um or it was not allowed to be on the roads and so what they did is they delayed the british automobile industry for almost almost 60 years giving the american auto industry a huge head start and we would have not we would be instead far behind not the red flag acts were tried to be passed here by the pennsylvania legislature early on and of course they were defeated so just know that because we because of the things that I'm going to say today are are, are seem to be um, are uh, that we th I think may be important. Just know that they are um, um, no, everybody won't agree. Okay. So I'm saying we have been in a neo -insti institutional Medicaid waiver era that where the goal of um, the Medicaid home and community based waivers was to keep people out of institutions. The methodologies we chose to do that were group homes, workshops, day centers, and, and Medicaid financing and congregate services that we know now is in violation of the Medicaid final rule. In other words, that's what's been happening for the last uh, 40 years. We, we might call it community based services, but what it really is is, to, is an alternative. So here's the money. So to understand clearly what I'm proposing right up front is that a 10 time increase in HCBA, HCBS waiver investment in community integrated employment. And here's why of the $64 billion we're now spending every year, not one time, every year. I think taxpayers would be very surprised to say, what, we're spending it every year? What are we getting for that? $64 billion we're spending only 1.8% of that of that 64 billion dollars less than less than even 1 billion dollars is being spent on community integrated employment what this is about to have what we want to happen between these next 10 years is a tenfold increase not overnight you don't suddenly say okay here's what we're, we're going to do but again a a gradual increase and I'll show you later about what I did to write, write, and with others, of course, to write a, 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 a home and community-based waiver to, do, to implement exactly this. So uh, for one particular state. So you can see at 0.8 billion, 1.2, you can see what it is. It's about 300,000, uh, 3, I'm sorry, about $300 million additional investment every year uh, until you, you over um, seven years reach reach the uh, $8 billion investment. Of course, the 64 billion will be much more than that by then, probably around 80 to 85, maybe even $90 billion because obviously people uh, continue uh, to continue to be born and need and need services. So it's not, it may seem, whoa, that'd be wild and radical, but we're just saying, no, I think it would make a whole lot of sense that we would, that we would invest a lot more in, in a psychosocial rehabilitation uh, and habilitation model that has such powerful results that when people are working side by side, they have significant disabilities alongside others um, who do not. Here's what we've been doing. Not my data, but it's right. It's from John Butter Butterworth and those folks and the state data that they do um, you know, every year, what's really going on. So here's what's really going on. Look, look, 
look down here on um, 1999. See that 38 percent? That's how many people went non-facility work 20 years ago in 1999. 38 percent in non-work facility. Where are we today? 52 percent. How many people were in community integrated employment in 1999? 24 percent. Where are we today? 20 percent. So if you say, okay, uh, we have employment first going on. We got a lot of these great things. We have great ideas. We got customized employment now. We really, really know what we're doing, and we do that far superior than what that we did know how to do with with integrated employment for for citizens. Uh, so now we have we have great tools, great knowledge. Uh, what we are not doing as well as we were doing 20 years ago. Yeah, that's what the data says. So uh, things need to change. We know more than ever about how to ensure successful uh, community integrated for citizens with disabilities, how to get them in a job that is in their ideal conditions of employment, a job that lasts, and we need to move the money in that direction. So yeah, I'm saying this, Stephen Wright, the comedian. Okay. Let's go. So post-pandemic policies and financing during high unemployment. Here's what people are going to be facing. I'm sorry I don't have enough work. You know, I'd like to speak to you about, right, community great employment. I have people waiting to come back to work, have friends, family out of work. I don't plan on hiring anyone for a while. I need to see how things go. It may be a while. This is what we're going to be facing right out of the gate once things settle down enough that we can begin assimilating into society. Uh, when that will be, I'm not going to predict that. You can, you, you, it's being predicted by at least um, you know 35 people a day. You can ob obviously, um, 35 different people a day, you can obviously see plenty of predictions of when that may be. But this is what I believe we're going to be facing. And that is that basically, um, a hold on there. You know, we're not going to, we're not going to, uh, we can't go that, uh, we, we, uh, we, we can't do this quite yet. 30, when, when I put this, when I worked on this um, tip for today, a week ago, that number was 22,000. A week ago, 22,000 Americans had filed for unemployment came. I had to get, I got back in and, and revised the slide to 30,000 because of what just happened in the last week. So 30,000 Americans filed for unemployment, 20% of Americans are unemployed. During the Great Depression, 25%, give you some perspective. Okay. Early data. There's the sighting. University of Syracuse, primarily looking at data in New York. But that's what it's saying. And when we're saying group settings, we're talking about group settings for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. In other words, business as usual. The idea of coming front for this, that we're going to continue as we are uh, grouping people in places that that we've never lived, then is likely not going to continue in the next decade. I don't think there's a lot of evidence that that would be the way we want to. There's a lot of evidence that people will want to keep it that way who have been doing it, but there's not enough evidence that that's the way we want to go. <clears throat> My suggestion, if you want to do some research now on non uh, on non employment policies to research, you need to look at your state's PASAR. PASAR was developed. It was P A S A A R, but it was be annual, but they changed it so it wouldn't be annual. But anyway, what PASAR was to do is for one thing. It was supposed to be a diversion to keep people out of um, uh, nursing homes that had significant. Um, intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, they were supposed to receive something called specialized services. You need to see what's happening with the PASAR. Is it actually working as diversion or triage? From my experience and my research and my work on the ground research with this, 
is that in some states it's working like it's supposed to, which is diversion, making sure these citizens do not end up spending the rest of their life in a, in a, in a, in a nursing home. And in, 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 in other cases, um, it's working like triage saying, oh, how old are you? Oh, if you're that age, then I think that nursing home's okay for you. So just know that we have some, and I'm talking about people with just intellectual development disabilities. So there's there's a, there's some issues um, around that. Specialized services uh, is is a kind is uh, is really waiver services that happen for the, for the temporary amount of time that somebody's in a nursing home. Community based ICF um, uh, uh, IDs for people with intellectual de developmental disabilities you need to see what's going on there. In other words, and then family host homes and group homes ratio. In other words, research might show that depending on the PASSAR policy, the specialized services uh, implementation in the states, the number of community ICF IDs they have, and what is the ratio in family host homes to group homes may be an indicator of how well that uh, uh, people are with, with intellectual and developmental disabilities may be doing during a pandemic. And post pandemic, some of these options and some of the ways we're doing things are, are really going to be, I uh, just say, just put it mildly, questions. So, <clears throat> post pandemic. <clears throat> Okay, so this is about the Medicaid final rule. We implemented it, you know, in 2014. It was to happen by uh, in five years, as promised by 2019. We were supposed to be states. Every state was to write plans and to begin implementing um, uh, folks leaving congregated and segregated settings and being a part of community life. Uh, it was postponed, though, in 2017 to 2022. So, no, it would have been nice if we would have had this, these all locked in and done and we were already moving. So a lot of things you're going to uh, see in, in the future uh, in this slide uh, and in, the, in, the, in this will be um, uh, is related to uh, uh, about this change. So, no, by 2022, those things are supposed to be happening. I want to just... Um, say something real quick about this slide here. You, you need to look at um, Dr. Caddy Inge's paper, um, the, 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 the article that she and uh, Dr. Tim Reese and Paul Wayman and others have written on what is going on in community integrated employment and customized employment um, in the United States. So that paper will be coming out shortly in the Journal of Vocational uh, Rehabilitation. And what it's talking about, it, everything that it says in there, that the, the great data that they have across multiple states will, will buttress what I'm saying today about what, where and how we might need to invest and what we may need to change. Uh, in services and supports for people to get the best out uh, best employment outcomes, but I'm sorry I didn't I didn't mention that um, that by uh, by Dr. Inge. Okay. Okay. Medicaid final rule settings <clears throat> must be in place. All right. Uh, now now understand there's a settings rule. Right off the gate, right out of the gate, it applies to day services. It applies to workshop. It isn't just when people are asleep. It doesn't just apply to group homes. It applies, includes day settings. So any setting that isolates people from the broader community services need to be changed. People need not to be in those type of settings. Competitive employment in the Medicaid final rule integrated with the coworkers do not have significant disabilities. Evidence that persons go places, attend events, individual and not as a small group as a billable service. Um, Medicaid final rule, persons with disabilities are fully integrated, individuals not receiving services. Setting should not have been designed to provide multiple services and activities on site specifically for persons with disabilities, which defines, of course, uh, a day center. So there's what's coming 
in um, again was was to be done by 2019, uh, got delayed, but by but 2022, uh, states started to begin implementing this. So. catch up here. United States Department of Justice. Segregation of day service facilities violation of ADA. These are not my words, it's their words. Unless the congregation segregation isolation general population can be justified. 2011, almost a decade ago. In the, in the home and community-based settings rule, integrated, integrated in supports and access to the greater community, provide, seek, seek employment competitive integrated settings, control personal policies, ensure individuals receive services. In other words, there's no problem with what we've done in the United States with implementing very thoughtful, progressive, good policy based on evidence. Obviously, the, the uh, Medicaid final rule is an example of that. We have had a real problem with enforcing that once people who feel like their cheese has been moved make a decision that, well, wait, wait a minute, let's see if we can, uh, I don't know if we can do that right now to see whatever we need to do. And of course, what it is about, of course, was one thing, it's about moving the dollars in a way thoughtfully and pragmatically to ensure that these better outcomes. So why the Medicaid final rule? Why did it even happen? Because the IDD system is not providing psychosocial habilitation and rehabilitation services. It looked a lot like custodial care. It looks like people were getting meals, people were getting getting uh, kept in safe places, people were getting the medicines they may need, and but that is very different than providing psychosocial habilitation rehabilitation services. So it's places for people to be at night and during the day, custodial care, that's a violation in the United States Supreme Court decision of Wyatt versus Stickney. Must be active treatment. The most important, <laughs> the most important thing I'll say today or, or that, that'll be up today is these, these few words. A service is not a place. If you want to see what the future service is going to look like in the next decade, what it absolutely should look like, it should be that a service should not be a place. And that's what we got now. A service is a place. A service should not be a place. Just think about it for a second. When you're, when you're, when you're implementing customized employment, a service is obviously not a place. It's a service that provides in a variety of many different places, not, not just one place. But a service, when a service becomes a place, then that's when you end up with people all grouped together, all in one setting. So a service is not a place. So in 1981, Secretary of Health and Human Services was given permission to uh, to waive um, uh, the the, the uh, rules the, uh, uh, and regulations for institutions and said, "Hey, why don't we move some of this money to the community and let's do let's, let's do this in a way that we can uh, prevent institutionalization." So um, they started doing that and states wrote, wrote the new waivers. Uh, it was a less expensive way to provide needed developmental non-medical services in the community. So it's like, okay, wait a minute, you're saying this costs less, gets better outcomes, um, families want it, uh, why not? So that's what they, they did. But we understand what they were doing. Is what they were doing primarily was an alternative to institutionalization, which is very different than developing something that, that could be very, very good for citizens with disabilities. Of course, many, many things were said, it's supposed to be all these other things, but what ended up happening was very different. So what's happened since, and I say 83 is when, when many, many states started really uh, writing uh, home and community-based waivers, is that it, uh, they've been keeping people out of, out of institutions, out of, out of institutions through privatized nonprofits uh, and for profits. So that's what what ended up being the result. That's where we are today in, in 2020, some uh, almost 40 years later. 
So people were in four, are today in four, six, and eight bed group homes, depending on what state you're in. And then where, where they were in institution grounds were in 12 or 16 bed group homes on the institution grounds. Do not believe those pictures that you see repeatedly of those giant old institutions with the, you know, all the windows and things. Of course they existed. But the institutions that most people were moved, moved from did not look like those. Instead, they look like I've just put here. 12 to 16 bed group homes on institution grounds. A long time ago, the institutions figured out we don't want to put people in these massive buildings like this because one big reason, disease spreads through them like wildfire. It is not a safe place for anybody to be working or to be in a giant building with um, tens of thousands of people all, all, all in there together, uh, you know, morning, noon, and night. So obviously they went to other smaller uh, ways to going about that long time before. So don't think we invented the idea of, of, a, of a group home. It was on the institution grounds and still are today uh, long after. So what happened was that workshops replaced workshops. Yes, their workshops were on the grounds. People were making products, making money, doing things for workshops. Um, day centers replaced day centers. People people traveled to, to um, not travel, they walked from their from their, um, their their group home, they walked across the uh, institution campus to their day center. Uh, bus transportation was was also these 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 campuses were huge. So bus transportation, uh, um, all Medicaid funded, were all funded you know to pay, provide bus transportation. And the executive directors um, uh, now now in the community replaced the institution superintendents. And some of them were the exact same people. To not today, of course. But um, executive directors replace institution superintendents. In other words, the institutional model. What I'm saying is that a lot, a lot of the vestiges of the institutional model uh, moved into the community. So what I'm saying is that in 2021, the secretary of the HHS should encourage states to rewrite home and community-based waivers to reduce and prevent group services and increase and provide integrated services, including including community integrated employment. Fidelity. You know, uh, it's not because of what I have to say. It has because of, 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 of a whole bunch of people um, whose shoulders I stand on. Is that, that what they have to say about what, what should happen for citizens with disabilities? What does the data show? What does the research show? What does the actual proof show? And what it says is that we have got to provide supports and services using that $64 billion worth of taxpayer money to deliver services that have validity and reliability to the outcomes we promised. That's very different than caretaking. It's very different than keeping people out of institutions. It's very different than just keeping people alive. It's about doing all those things, of course, but it's also about delivering results on real outcomes. And th this phrase, freedom from the grasp of the dead man's hand, is a, is a famous phrase that's used in literature lots. And, and, it's, and its point is simply this, is that there are guys who are no longer with us that thought of ideas like institutionalization, thought of ideas like community-based group homes, thought of ideas like shelter workshops, day centers, other ideas about where people with intellectual and developmental disabilities should be, where they could be safe, where they should be cared, and, 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 and to where they could learn new things. And what we're saying is, is that this is about freedom from, the, from the, their thinking. This is about thinking about things very differently, about how people with significant challenges to employment and, and life in the community can be, can be the life in the community, can, can live the same lives that the rest of us do. How can we go about doing that? And John O'Brien, and I'm so sure some of you know who John is. Of course, he's um, um, absolutely a mentor to, to, to every one of us. And that is that John wrote this great paper one time. We wrote, you know, he's written hundreds of great papers. But, um, but, but the idea of what we have now is those above are guiding the hands of those below. We have people in, in management roles in human services, either at the state level or in the executive level at the provider agencies 
that are guiding the hands of the people who work, uh, direct, I'm talking about direct support professionals who work on behalf of people every single day. And we've got to change that. We've got to have the minds, the minds of, of uh, uh, not just the minds on high guiding the hands of those below, but we've got to have the minds of, of everyone uh, focused on how do we deliver supports and services community integrated employment in a manner that delivers um, real outcomes for people, not because somebody said it's a thing to do, because we have proof and evidence that going about doing things this way makes a big difference. So states wanted Medicaid waivers because less cost, better outcomes, less liability, less custodial care, more psychosocial rehab care, less, ta less taxpayer funding, more taxpayer investment. Okay. Functional skills one on one, one on one. If you don't teach somebody how to do something, then then they of course um, you're going to have to be paid to do it. So that's what habilitation and rehabilitation are about. Is how can we ensure the well being, not just well being of citizens, but how they can we teach and, and 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 create skills. That's what we sold to Congress years ago. Why we said we have something called the developmental model that allows people who people thought could never learn anything and said they can learn a whole life of things, all the things we do, we can learn, except it just takes takes some more time and takes people to really know what they're doing, working by, uh, with them side by side. So this, that's what the, excuse me, that's what functional skills are about. Okay. Uh, basic HCBS waiver then is, uh, you know, day activity in the group home today and the group home at night, Medicaid funded transportation to and from, you know, they're at, you're at the group home at night, day activity and day, transportation between. Service became a place, 62.4 of the 64 billion spent an annually. American law, LC versus Olmstead, integration mandate, American Disabilities Act, reasonable accommodation, right? Those two powerful powerful four powerful war, words integration mandate and uh, and reasonable accommodation are our are, are federal laws driving helping to drive this okay so new medicaid fidelity waivers authorized to deliver these best best practices to deliver best practices uh, for habilitation and re rehabilitation so fidelity waivers that is waivers that have evidence that they are that the delivering these services and these supports in this manner and the and together deliver these better outcomes uh, uh, are based on reasonable costs on a provider's reasonable costs ensure the sort of supports improve the recipient situation effective to the extent that recipients are included in the life of society and this last one the controversial one reduce the individual's need for taxpayer finance support in other words, uh, psychosocial rehabilitation and method and, and, and uh, rehabilitation and um, habilitation rehabilitation methodologies like customized employment that actually reduce taxpayer finance support and, and put more of the resources that are available in our society uh, in the hands of people with disabilities themselves. Okay, Medicaid waivers, back to them. You know, data, metabolic effects of psychotropic medications. That's what the data is showing is happening under the waiver system we have now. Loneliness, pervasive loneliness of folks. Um, national core indicators, again, another good source of data uh, that's collected by the National Association of State, State Development on Display Directors showing what's going on with, with people. Unemployment, we got that, remember that? We have that, that low investment. And of course, poverty, as if Oh, well, the reason why they're impoverished must be because they have a significant intellectual and developmental disabilities or have mental health needs. That must be natural to be poor if you have that, right? So, no, I don't think so. This is saying something very, very different. It's saying that we now know, it isn't like we have to, oh, we have to find these things. We now know how to deliver, d deliver extremely creative uh, rehabilitation and psychosocial um, interventions that make a difference. And today we're paying people eight to thirteen dollars per hour to deliver um, to deliver um, these services. So D the DSPs, kind folks, 
doing the best they can under the, uh, the absolute circumstance they have, 40 to 60 percent turnover, trying to deliver um, service and supports for, for folks. So we need more professional positions, psychosocial habilitation, rehabilitation, community integration, employment. A lot, of, a lot like the folks that we had from about 1986 to 2000, there were a lot of folks that looked a lot like the like the uh, professional positions that were delivering uh, employment. It may be some of the reasons that earlier data when I showed you that the number of people in community integrated employment, the percent there, how it was higher before than it was than it is today. Um, there's further data to show that that is the that is the case. How much money? I, one of the best bosses I've ever had. My first four hours, I was a state commissioner, and she said. Uh, Commissioner, let me tell you, a lot of people could come up to you and they're going to say how beautiful your tie is today and just how nice and oh, oh, you're just the greatest thing to slice bread. But she said, Steve, remember this, it's not about the money unless it's about the money and it's always about the money. So know this, then in, in, in 1989, uh, $1 to then whatever $1 was then, it's two thirteen today. A $39 rate in 1989, which is what the rate when um, when myself and others um, had the largest community integrated employment program in the United States. We didn't know it at the time, know it now. Uh, we had 36 employment specialists getting jobs for a couple hundred folks a year that um, average in 26 hours employment. Uh, every week that we were paid $39 an hour in 1989. That rate today would be $83 an hour, just, just controlling for inflation. What we're paying DSPs are nine to $15 an hour. People need to think about what we need to pay to deliver high quality psychosocial community integrated employment services. that can deliver the ideal conditions of employment. So uh, we need to bluntly said more taxpayer investment in the 16 hours people are awake, a little less taxpayer investment in the eight hours are asleep. That would be the shift in financing. So uh, What we did then uh, in Kentucky when when I was the state commissioner of mental health and, and intellectual development displays is we rewrote the waivers. We moved 11% of the money that were going to congregate and segregated services into uh, more investment in people into community integrated employment. We, we uh, increased the community integrated employment rate that they had by two and a half times. Um, we partnered with vocational rehabilitation um, um, and, and both David and I you know, won awards for all we had done, but that's really nice to the award. You should see the awards that people with, with significant disabilities got when they were now working uh, regularly in the community. So uh, this was published by Chaz Mosley. Uh, I'm sorry, it was written by Chaz Mosley, who was the um, uh, work for the National Association of State DD Directors and Harold Kleiner and uh, uh, Kathy Shepard Jones, which is still at the university there at the University of Kentucky and myself. And just so you can look at to see how you pragmatically and thoughtfully go about it didn't happen overnight. 11% of the money did not move uh, overnight. A year is five years over five years, as I described before, is, is, a, is a good way to go about moving moving those dollars. Okay. Okay. Okay, so did you know that waivers, let's get to the changes that we could have, we can do right now. Did you know that waivers can um, pay for education and training of community and family members? 
they can. Individual individual waivers can home and community based waivers has a service called education and training cannot pay for the education and training of people who uh, work on their behalf directly through the provider organizations, but it can train can teach and train family members and and community members. It can pay for non educational services of students while they're in school. Participant directed waiver services can deliver um, uh, can allow more flexibility for, by who is hired and who is on behalf of citizens with disabilities. When individual budgets are created, it allows the individual to participant direct the dollars in ways that make a difference. Doesn't mean that everybody oh they just take the money and go off and just hire their uh, their brother or other family members to go about doing helping them instead what individual budgets allow is allow you to to fund both traditional and non-traditional providers to deliver uh, supports and services to folks it requires a fiscal intermediary i won't go into the all the details about that but it's a fiscal intermediary hat holds the medicaid number so for example if you're in customized employment and um, you want somebody to have a, a, a good job, then what, we, what we've always done in community, not always, what we've largely done in community and great employment is get people jobs that are, people can easily uh, be taught and trained to do. In other words, the bridge to community life is a narrow one and was solely contingent on the skills and abilities of whoever that employment specialist was. And what this is saying is that the coworker that Medicaid dollars can be used to pay a coworker, a somebody who is who's already was there employed in the company, the person who actually has the skills to know how to deliver that service can be used to pay pay for that time that they're uh, excuse me that they're delivering that service. And then. Um, Again, it would take uh, you know, a lot more time, but transparent individual provider rates so that everybody knows um, why. It, it's like I had a provider say to me one time, said, OK, tell me this. How come that provider, this is a long, long time ago, how come that provider was getting $39 an hour to deliver support and employment in the community? And how come I'm getting $28 an hour? Now tell me that same service. How come one person's getting 39, one person's getting 28? I said, well, because it has completely to do with what is packed inside of that $39 or inside that $28. And then for $39, what they're giving is a lot more, a lot more services, supports, value, and mostly pay to the persons that actually doing that, those, that work. So that's what transparent individual provider rates are about. And by the way, when people say uh, about transparent individual provider rates, just to the point example, there's 453 nursing homes in the state of Florida, and every single one of them have an individual customized rate because Medicaid law requires that rates be based on provider costs, on a reasonably principled analysis of provider costs. But here we are. In, in services for intellectual and developmental disabilities, and we have rates that are statewide rates, and we think that's normal and natural, whereas it is actually quite abnormal and quite unnatural when you look at how rates are developed for people that have significant um, uh, needs that uh, through a, um, uh, a need for a Medicaid service. But in, in IDD, it's primarily statewide. Another, another post-pandemic service tool is something called a community guide service. Community guide service is somebody who finds non-traditional providers, helps with individual budgeting, helps uh, hire and, and fire people on behalf of, uh, of the, uh, you know, the citizen that has a, that is a participant in the, in the service. Something called goods and services. These are all waiver services that have been in waivers in places where that I have worked for 30 years. 
goods and services are a waiver service that that um, allows you to buy almost any good or any service that is beneficial to the person. So um, it is uh, something that could be used in customized employment, maybe to buy, maybe to purchase an, a, 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 a tangible asset that the person needs to be able to to be able to to be a part of a uh, uh, an integrated psychosocial rehabilitation methodology, which is which is words for to be able to be able to have a particular job that pays more. And uh, anyway, goods and services, education, training services I mentioned before. Uh, has, has to do with training family members and and community members, and of course customized employment services, which you can find out a whole lot more about by listening to uh, what what so many other uh, of my great colleagues have to say at um, at Griffin Hammis. So customized employment, that is the ultimate <laughs> post pandemic tool, is about discovery, not evaluations. It's about community employment activities, not situational assessments. It's about inter, inter, inter uh, informational interviews that expand opportunities well beyond realistic. I've talked about that before, about possibilities and probabilities. And then customized job development is about uh, it is an alternative to non-traditional job development. The uh, customized job development uh, has an asterisk by it because um, uh, upcoming um, next week, I'll be doing a, a one hour um, uh, on, uh, webinar on uh, introduction to uh, the Discovery Fidelity Scale. And the week after that, a one hour introduction to the job development fidelity scale and so you're welcome to uh, to hear about those two uh, tools <clears throat> so uh, customized employment's about employment negotiation not filling vacancies you know I I had a supervisor um, say to me a, a, a vocational rehabilitation area supervisor say Steve, I'm now realizing that forever, for years and years, we thought we were doing job development. We thought in vocational rehabilitation, we were paying for job development. But you know what we were really paying for? We were paying for job finding services. It wasn't job development at all. It was job finding. They were merely finding where there might be vacancies or places for people to be um, um, to work in the community, not actually developing the jobs or finding what would be the ideal conditions of employment for individuals. So self-employment is also a possibility, of course, in customized employment where people become on their own business owners. Uh, there's businesses within a business, which is a value added service inside of a business that actually increases more customers for whatever the primary business is. Uh, there's the resource ownership, what I talked about, which is a tangible asset. You know, some of us bring as a tangible asset our college degree or experience or training. Well, this is a tangible asset that, that you know, another tangible asset uh, for people with significant uh, disabilities that they they um, uh, uh, can use. Um, and in a consultative employment support model instead of instead of the job coaching model, which says we want people who actually know how to do the work to be able to um, provide the, um, the, the, the the training and support and uh, uh, for the citizen at the uh, at the regular job site. OK, so um, and this one is um, is just a, a little piece that just says as we're going about doing this. We might just think for a second that maybe if this works so well for people that have significant intellectual and developmental disabilities and for people with significant mental health needs, maybe a whole bunch of other people who are underemployed or not employed, then 
can also benefit from this type of methodology. In other words, we have an Elizabethan poor law in 1601 that said, oh, no, no, we're only supposed to be giving services to the to, the, to what they term the deserving poor. And so, so yes, people with significant uh, disabilities that we described are, are considered deserving poor, but we may want to consider um, you know, something else. I would just say this is that there has been organizations that that I've been a part of and that have and uh, that I've ha that I've helped with that um, where I've been over the over maybe the overall financing of, of an organization that that have learned a lot and have transferred the skills and, and abilities they learned for working on uh, working on behalf of people with intellectual and, and developmental disabilities and particularly in employment and have now transferred those skills to all kinds of other folks who who are uh, unemployed and uh, unemployed people uh, generally uh, being termed as people who use um, are recipients of welfare and, and it has been tremendously successful. So just let, just to say that why would you go about doing things the way you've always done things if there is a, a better way that that we have the research of um, that a, a reliable a more reliable and valid method for um, for doing something. Um, OK. So everything else I'm going to say is radical uh, in, in the last uh, 15 minutes. It's um, uh, radical to us, uh, but it's common in other countries and particularly in the 30 um, European countries. First, mandatory targeted population hiring. So in, in, in almost every single European country, then they have, uh, if you have a, a, a business that has over 50 people that employed, then you're required by their federal laws to hire people that, that we would say are typically people that would be eligible for supported employment and customized employment. So it's saying that it's mandatory that you uh, that businesses uh, hire those folks. In other words, to not hire those folks means that there would be too many people that would be in day centers with each other and, and, and workshops and those kind of places instead um, of, of being employed. So that it's mandatory targeted hiring of, of populations. Um, wage subsidy. It says that um, the government is for hiring citizens that have very significant disabilities, then we are going to then pay their wage, usually at the beginning, up to 100 percent, depending on the country, and then that amount being lowered, but continuing at about a 50 percent rate from that point on. And so folks are saying, whoa, so you mean that employers they're mandated to hire but you're saying also that the government is also ensuring that that they are hired and that the government is also giving a wage subsidy to employers um, to pay the wage of the person that is hired yes quite quite common here's what europeans say about us they say you know what you all do is you try to get people in jobs who out of their kindness of their heart then are willing to help people and you know everything about customized employment is the opposite of that it's about obviously showing the skills abilities um, it's about a consultative job site support it's about making sure that it isn't just kindness of, of, any, of anybody's heart but this is a valued employee that um, that that you know you can depend on that will be working here um hopefully forever that's what that's what it's based but again as europeans look at us they're saying you know you just have certain empl certain employers that actually hire people with disabilities and a whole bunch of other employers maybe even the overwhelming majority of employers then they don't participate at all because they simply choose not to and that is not how we operate in, in our country so no that that wage subsidy is something we'll need to consider in a post pandemic time to encourage the employment of citizens. Um, and of course, what I mentioned before, the paid subsidy uh, for our coworkers, that is the coworkers are paid for their training skills because we don't want people with disabilities only be able to have jobs that an employment specialist can teach them 
or help them learn. Instead, we want to be sure that they are taught by the best and the brightest, which is the actual coworker who knows how to provide to provide that skill. In fact, what Medicaid requires and, and, and Voc Rehab is not to give money to anybody that does not have the skills to actually deliver the psychosocial rehabilitation, habilitation intervention. But yet that's commonly what we do. And that, that I believe, is why that road to, to community and employment is so narrow, because we're not including the coworkers that have those skills. Other things is uh, universal basic income. You may have heard something about that but it's family and individual subsidy. That is that simply saying that to, to exist in any society, you need a, uh, that, that, that certainly ha any society that has capitalism as its major socioeconomic system, then you definitely would ha have to have universal basic income to be sure there was no such thing as a citizen that didn't have any money if it required money to actually do anything in the society. So just know that that is also a part of what this uh, might be about. Also, flex security, that's their version of those 30 European countries of social security, which says that um, we're not going to take away your, your, your social security, as we would say it. Your social security is, um, is already um, guaranteed for you, you know, for your, excuse me a moment. Your social security is already um, uh, uh, guaranteed for you and given to you because you qualified for that because of your disability. So why would we take it away? Why would, because that's not qualified for that. Why would we take it away because of employment? And then, of course, the uh, three out of the last uh, uh, in, in the last seven years, the, the the Nobel prizes that have been won have been won by uh, on the concept of, uh, of behavioral economics, which say that people will say no to something if they're going to lose something. So that's and the concept is called loss avoidance. If people feel like they're going to lose something, then oftentimes they um, um, will say, no, I, I don't think I want to try that. I'm afraid I'll lose some money uh, by uh, by working, even if well, no, no, you can make up a whole lot more. You can, you can have a whole lot more money by working. You know, still, you know, with that, but what, am I going to lose anything? Well, yeah, just a little bit. But what, what the research is showing is that we need to take a, a, a strong look at policies that people, um, that cause people to lose in order to gain. And then, of course, uh, universal transportation. Uh, you know, 93% of the people that were flying daily on an airline uh, uh, are no longer. So we have seven percent of the airlines filled today, and we've always known that airlines are not so good for people who have significant um, uh, needs, uh, mobility needs. Who people who may use um, who may use uh, wheelchairs and and, and motorized chairs in various forms, and so um, as other countries have, they have of course high speed ground transportation connecting the major cities which allows for people with significant disabilities to get along, get around far, 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 you know, much more. It also connects cities to uh, people who live in cities to the economic advantages of working in one major city and living in another or working in one area and living in another. Um, other sorts of things, uh, 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 rural residents uh, nation, obviously we need broadband for all the rural residents. Another, another thing that might be a possibility um, that some people are considering because we need to have be sure the entire society is connected. And then uh, employee owned service providers. People think that the only option you have is either for profit uh, companies uh, providing services for people with disabilities or not for profit companies providing services for people with disabilities. When a third option that again is widely used uh, again throughout Europe and particularly Germany is employee owned service providers. That is that um, that empl em uh, employee owned, meaning that the, the people who actually work uh, at, at a company are also part owners of that company and they have all the tax advantages of a not for profit. In other words, there's no taxes paid to uh, a, an employee owned company, but it um, it is able to uh, um, but there, but no, there's no taxes, you know, paid. But the taxes then are paid through the 
uh, income that goes directly to the um, to the uh, uh, employees. So we maybe this is the beginning of an era, asylum era. 1620, 1849, then we had the state institution era from about 1850 to 1960, and, and people would debate, you know, the, these these dates, but roughly they're the same. Uh, what I've termed a home and, 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 and institution era from 1960 to 1983, um, and then the, uh, the what I, I'm terming the neo-institution era, from uh, which people would oftentimes uh, refer to as the community the community-based services era from um, 1983 to 2020 and 2021 to 2030 or beyond, the fidelity services area, where we're using science and research and proof that uh, of, of the, the uh, efficacy of delivering a service, not what somebody convinced us by writing a great book or having a great uh, thinking or where the money might be going or any of those things. Instead, what does the science say we should be doing on behalf of citizens that have these significant em uh, employment challenges to ensure that they they um, get the very best shot at being employed in community and working alongside every one of us. So I started with Wolfensberger, employment subsidies, individual budgets, participant directed financing, direct subsidy to persons or families can be a powerful adjunct to the, his words, armamentarium of, of tools useful in implementing normalization. I won't read any further about that, but you can see especially in the context of new administrative structures and human management systems, direct subsidy can, can be combined with other new helpful forms in develop, developing uh, a, a strong way for the implementation of the principle of normalization. 1972, the last two pages of normalization, probably the least read pages in that book uh, are, in, are in agreement with everything we've talked about we've talked about today is that is that uh, is that um, is that there are other ways ways that that Wolfensberger saw way before any of us imagined that that we could further extend how we would change uh, our, our um, system structures to be able to implement uh, 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 lives worth living in the community for every one of, uh, of uh, the American citizens. So um, if you have, uh, uh, and again, I apologize that it had to be me just rattling on and, and on, uh, you know, page after page with this, uh, but I, uh, uh, I do thank you for uh, spending your time, uh, you know, with me today. And uh, if you have questions or thoughts about what I had, uh, it said you're welcome to write me and, and, I'll, and I'll correspond with you and um, and hopefully we'll uh, we'll uh, hear or, or see you again uh, in another uh, uh, webinar through uh, uh, Griffin Hammes Associates. Thanks a lot for um, uh, again spending your time with uh, me today. Take care. <laughs>